directed at pros like you guys. Uh, but this is the kind of thing that I uh, interact with the public with, try to give them some idea of all the nonsense that is going on uh, out there. Uh, I should mention that uh, we have no conflict of interest. We do not accept any money from any vested source. And our only allegiance is to the scientific method. Makes no difference to me or to my staff whether or not any medication or cosmetic or food additive is regulated or not. The only thing that matters is that whatever decision is arrived at is arrived at on proper scientific methodology, not on emotion and not on, on hearsay. Uh, of course, as you know, there is a lot of nonsense out there. There are snake oil salesmen plying their trade all over the place. Our task is to replace them with proper science. And these days that is very, very challenging because there's a tsunami of uh, quacks uh, that uh, threaten to drown science. And they are very good at what they do. I have to give them begrudging respect uh, uh, for that. But it's more important now than ever to separate facts from myth. And this is, <laughs> let me just uh, turn that off. <laughs> My daughter just flew to, to uh, Florida and I told her to tell me as soon as she got there. So that's what that was. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, it's more important now than ever to separate uh, facts from, uh, from myths. And uh, the area that um, you're interested in is uh, alternative medicine. And to get information about it is very much like trying to drink from the fire hose. And this is what the internet has done for us. It's a wealth of information, both good and bad. I mean, we know that there are five scientific papers published every minute, every single day. It has a lot of info to, to um, encompass. So anyway, it's, it, it is uh, very challenging to uh, separate the facts uh, uh, from, uh, from the myths. So let's get started with uh, so-called alternative medicine which is somewhat difficult to, to define. You go into a bookstore these days and uh, you see shelves and shelves of books uh, about all aspects of alternative medicine. And really one of the questions that we have to raise is what is the difference between alternative medicine and quackery? Because that can be a very, very blurred line. It's something that I have fun investigating. I am a big fan of Sherlock Holmes, and Holmes, as you know, was the ultimate in scientific investigation. Uh, his motto was that uh, you have to have the facts before you come up with any theories, not the other way around. And uh, this is what we do through my office. We investigate, and these are just some of the aspects of uh, alternative medicine that uh, we have uh, investigated. But of course, there are many, many uh, more. What all of these have in common is that they lack evidence because if they had evidence, then they would cross the bridge and uh, become just medicine. I mean, you know the old joke, what do you call alternative medicine that works? Medicine. So we have to tackle this, this question of, you know, what, what is this? What are we talking about? What is uh, alternative medicine? Because uh, once evidence has been provided, it's no longer alternative. The classic example is, of course, Barry Marshall's idea about Helicobacter pylori infections. And I'm sure many of you remember that, as, as I do, when he first came out with this idea in 1983 that um, ulcers were caused by uh, a bacterium. We laughed at that. We said, well, no, ulcers are, are caused by hyperacidity. They're, they're caused by stress. They're caused by too many spicy foods. But he persisted. And then, of course, in a very foolhardy fashion, he swallowed some bacteria, uh, got gastritis, and cured himself with uh, antibiotics. And that uh, intrigued the scientific community. And within two years, randomized controlled trials had been done. And uh, triple therapy was instituted within three years of Barry Marshall's discovery. And of course, eventually he and uh, Robin Warren got the Nobel Prize for this very deserved. So something that first seemed very alternative now is obviously mainstream because the evidence has become evident. So how do we best define alternative medicine? 
To me, it is medicine that we don't teach in med school. And the reason we don't teach it is because we like to think that what we teach is evidence-based. And there isn't enough evidence for the alternative stuff. It is mostly hearsay and anecdote and wishful thinking and a great deal of, of flim flam. The, the classic one, of course, is the snake oil. Snake oil was real. Clark Stanley snake oil sold extremely well in the late 1800s because it was supposed to cure arthritis. Snakes are supple, they curve all over the place. So they seem to be well lubricated on the inside. So the idea was that if you could just isolate this lubricant, you could use it in people. Well, obviously it didn't really work except for the placebo effect. And that is really what ties together all of these therapies that really don't have any evidence. But I don't want to suggest that, that this uh, is meaningless. The placebo effect is not meaningless at all because uh, uh, let's face it. I mean, if your perception is that you have less pain, you've benefited from it. But of course, placebos don't cure anything. They just change the perception. But historically, this is one of the most important interventions in medicine. Just think back, bloodletting went on for 2,500 years before we figured out that this really wasn't very effective and people swore by it. And then along came Anton Mesmer in the uh, 18th century. And uh, Mesmer figured that he could draw disease out of people using magnets. And he had uh, his... Uh, victims uh, just sit around the table and hold on to magnetized rods and have the disease sucked out of them. This uh, did not sit well with the Viennese medical establishment because he was stealing their patients. It was a lot more seductive to sit there and hold on to magnetized rods than to undergo the medical therapy of those days, which was mostly purging and, and bleeding. So of course the patients prefer this, but anyway, he got chased out of Vienna. He set up shop in Paris where he catered to the rich young hypochondriacs. And he figured out that you didn't even need the magnetic rods because young, good looking men were themselves human magnets and they could draw disease out of people. So he had the ladies come and sit knee to knee to these good looking young men to be mesmerized. And as he recorded in his diary, some of these ladies had to be taken to the back room for further therapy, but he was vague about what that therapy was. So mesmerism we think is gone, bygone era. Not so, it has re-emerged in the guise of biomagnetism. These days you just put bio in front of a word and, and that, a very good marketing uh, term. What is biomagnetism? It is the idea that you can cure disease by putting magnets of different polarities on the body. And they have all kinds of interesting diagrams about where you want the positive magnets and the negative magnets. And of course you can buy all of these magnets. And as you can see, they are not cheap. Now, of course, the whole concept of positive and negative magnets is absurd. Every magnet has a positive and a negative uh, uh, pole. But uh, uh, obviously people will spend this money and many will tell you how much better they feel after they have been magnetized. And uh, there of course are people who feel that they are magnetized when they get the COVID vaccine as well. But that's another story maybe for, for another time. Uh, the um, uh, whole concept of this uh, biomagnetism, of course, has been applied to COVID. Every nonsense has been applied to COVID. And here's a clinic that was claiming to rid your body of the virus by using these biomagnets. This whole scheme was the brainchild of Dr. Isaac Goiz, a Mexican physician, who claimed that he had cured a patient by putting magnets on his thymus gland and in his rectum. Part, probably not a particularly pleasant uh, procedure, 
after, but he claimed that it worked. And this started this whole field of biomagnetism. What can you say about this kind of thing? I mean, just I, 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 you know, I mean, and, but it happens. And uh, of course, one can draw on numerous examples like applied kinesiology. You may have seen some of this because they sometimes practice this in shopping centers where they will try to sell you some sort of product and ask you to hold out your arm. They push down your arm, which they do with great ease. And then they make you hold a bottle of whatever is selling in their hand. And they try to push your arm down again. And this time they struggle. And uh, the idea is that the medicine has infused you with its aura. Uh, there's a, a very good video that uh, was made in a clandestine fashion in a health food store where a person comes in and, and speaks to the uh, attendant who the week before may have been mopping floors at McDonald's, but now all of a sudden is a health expert and uh, tells the um, uh, complainant to put the thumb and the finger together and then he tries to force them apart, which he does with great ease. And then he has him hold a bottle of something, a sealed bottle in his other hand, and again, tries to force the fingers apart and this time has a great difficulty doing it. Why? because you need this product. And it's just amazing that people buy into this kind of scheme, but they do. And uh, this, is, uh, this is one of the most popular nonsensical schemes that is out there. <clears throat> now on a much more serious note, we have the uh, so-called alternative cancer world. And Laetrile is one of the flagship products. Uh, Laetrile uh, really came to the fore as far as the public is concerned when Steve McQueen went to Mexico to have uh, Laetrile treatment. Obviously, it, it did not work. But Laetrile is still with us. Sometimes it is called vitamin B17. And of course, there is no vitamin B17. But there is some interesting chemistry here because Laetrile contains amygdalin. And uh, those of you who may remember your organic chemistry, you'll recognize the uh, functional group at, at the right, which uh, <clears throat> when hydrolyzes gives you benzaldehyde and, and, uh, and cyanide. So amygdalin is capable of releasing cyanide. And the argument always has been that the cyanide is toxic, but it will, uh, it will destroy cancer cells preferentially because those are multiplying more quickly. And on a superficial level, that makes somewhat of a sense. But the fact is that it just doesn't work. Uh, taking apricot pits, as Steve McQueen did, does not cure cancer. Now, we don't say this because it doesn't make physiological sense. <clears throat> we say this because studies have been done and proper randomized trials have been done with Laetrile and unfortunately have shown no result. I say, unfortunately, because it would be great if you could just go and buy some apricot pits and cure your cancer. They're very careful, of course, about what they actually say on the product. As you see here, <clears throat> good for health, et cetera. They're very vague and they use the word alleged. And as soon as you use the word alleged, then uh, you're, you're clear, uh, at least uh, legally. But of course, you can sell your books and your pamphlets beside the product and claim that the apricot pit will have an effect on, on cancer. Uh, in, in Canada, one of the products that uh, I guess we're famous for in the alternative uh, cancer world is SEAC. And uh, very, very aggressively marketed. It was <clears throat> invented or, it, well, I don't know if invented would be the right term, first marketed by a nurse, Renee Kais. And uh, she very cleverly named her product the reverse of her name. So SEAC is the reverse of Kais. And that kind of makes sense because she got things backwards anyway. Uh, she uh, interacted with the natives, with indigenous people, and apparently learned some herbal lore from them and became a guru of herbalism. And she became famous 
there's a statue of her with uh, this uh, plaque, as you can see, the discoverer of uh, SEAC for which she, she gets credit. And uh, this uh, herbal mix is actually composed of four different kinds of, of herbs. And needless to say, there is no evidence that these have any activity against cancer. And of course, they're very careful in the advertising. So here is one way that they, they promoted, as you can see, for over 70 years, this uh, herbal tonic has been used. Well, just because something has been used for 70 years, obviously does not mean that it has been used effectively for 70 years. Uh, but this is again, a very common marketing thing. And <clears throat> they, they infer that if something has longevity, it must have so because it, it is effective. Well, we know of course that that is, uh, is not the case. What we know is that um, investigations have been done, this one Mayo Clinic, and it just doesn't work. You know, we, I'm sure we all wish that we could tell people that, that apricot pits or SEAC can cure their cancer <laughs> because uh, contrary to what uh, unfortunately so many members of the public think, the scientific community is not in cahoots with big pharma to try to sweep effective drugs under the carpet so that uh, big pharma can market their expensive, ineffective drugs. I mean, that's just not the way things work, but unfortunately, that is the impression. The Gerson therapy, one of the most popular of the alternative uh, cancer therapies, and um, the originator of this was Max Gerson, a, a German uh, physician. And now there are Gerson clinics in Hungary, in, uh, in Mexico, and uh, there are therapists in the US and in Canada who will send people to Gerson um, sites in, in Mexico. Well, what do you get if you undergo the Gerson uh, therapy? You get to drink a lot of juices, but they're not ordinary juices. They have to be squeezed in a special way. In order to do that, you need a machine. And that machine costs about $2,000. So you will think that you can just take an ordinary juicer and <clears throat> use the same fruits and vegetables and do that. But you'll be disappointed, it won't work. But the Gerson people will tell you that it doesn't work because you need this machine in order to make sure that you get all the nutrients out of the, uh, the fruit. You can also go to the uh, Gerson therapy uh, clinics and uh, be treated to a coffee enema. And as we know, uh, coffee is much more effective when you consume it orally uh, than when you introduce it through the real portals. At least when you drink it, you get the pleasure of enjoying uh, the coffee. Needless to say, there's no evidence for the juicing or for the enemas. You get some testimonials uh, because of course, for short periods of time, the mind can overcome the body in terms of perception. But we followed up on this and uh, I mean, it, it's not easy to get uh, the Gerson people to give you names of patients that they claim that they have cured. But we eventually did get about 10 names. We tracked them down, nine of them had died within a year of the Gerson therapy and one was still alive, but of course still had, had cancer. But of course they claim all kinds of, uh, of successes. Then you may remember on 60 Minutes in 1993, this was a really big deal. When Mike Wallace uh, interviewed William Lane, who's not a medical doctor, in fact, he had no expertise in that relevant area, but he had read about a study in Cuba where they had used shark cartilage to treat cancer. And that study, which essentially turned out to be fraudulent, uh, it made the headlines on 60 Minutes. And uh, 60 Minutes usually does a pretty good job you know, investigating. They didn't do a good job on this one. And they promoted the shark cartilage business extensively uh, to, to the extent that, of course, the scientific community had to somehow look at it and react and, and did. And a number of studies were carried out and showed that, uh, no, it doesn't work. And of course, we also learned that sharks actually do get cancer and they even have cancer of their cartilage. Um, but this still persists. The shark cartilage mist is out there, the story 
that drugs don't get cancer. Uh, and desperate people will do desperate things. And you know that it's happening because you can go on Amazon and there they are. There are all the shark cart cartilage uh, products. Obviously, they cannot tell you on the label that uh, it is for cancer, but that is the the message, the implied message. And of course, you can buy William Lane's book on Amazon too, about how sharks don't get, uh, get cancer. There was some reason to, to look into this in some depth, because it turns out that uh, uh, sharks, while they do get cancer, actually seem to get it more rarely than other animals. I'm not sure how they actually know that, <laughs> but anyway, they, they do. So it was worth looking into, but the studies have shown that uh, it just isn't there. And that Cuban study, uh, really, when you uh, look at it in detail, I mean, it was extremely poorly done. There were no proper controls. So it, it just was nothing. Today, we get this stuff from Cuba, Escazine. And uh, this is another animal product. This comes from the blue scorpion, the venom of the blue scorpion. And uh, there actually has been some scientific research on this. Unfortunately, it uh, doesn't corroborate what the marketers uh, claim, because if you look at the website, and of course they have very elaborate uh, websites, and tell you that that just about every disease will respond to to this, and how it contains special proteins. Well, this thing is to be taken orally, so those proteins are not going to survive the digestive tract anyway. But uh, Escozine is, is very aggressively marketed, again, to cancer patients. And while you can do some laboratory studies in the Petri dish in cultured cancer cells and maybe see some effect, that obviously does not mean that it will work in humans. So this is an, another weapon that is very often used by the alternative promoters is that they will extrapolate from, from uh, in vitro studies or from animal studies uh, to humans without having the, the relevant steps um, in between. But here is the, the ultimate nonsense though about this blue scorpion venom. It is now available in a homeopathic version. Well, in this case, we can say pretty categorically that this is not going to do anything because no homeopathic product can do anything because it doesn't contain anything. So the uh, homeopathic version of this uh, blue scorpion venom is nonsense on top of nonsense because blue scorpion venom doesn't do anything. And it certainly is not going to do anything when it's diluted to an extreme that it doesn't even contain a single molecule of the original. So what is homeopathy? And I want, I want to, to finish off with this because I think this is very important. We've done a lot of research on this and I know that most people do not know what homeopathy is and that includes nurses, physicians, teachers, educated people. So first let's just make sure, understand what homeopathy is not. It is not an umbrella term for all of the alternative stuff. That's not what homeopathy is, but this is what well over 90% of the public thinks, that homeopathy is just general alternative uh, medicine. No, homeopathy is a very specific therapeutic system. I put medicine in quotes, of course. And it's based on the idea that if you have a healthy person and you give them some substance, which eventually will trigger some symptom, then that substance in an extremely diluted form will treat that symptom. This makes no sense whatsoever scientifically. The substances that they use, a large variety, plant matter, animal matter, whatever it is, it is diluted to the extent that there's no remnant of the original. The homeopathy uh, was, uh, the brainchild of Samuel Hahnemann, a physician way back in the 18th century. He was a properly trained doctor, but let's face it, in those days, what were you trained to do? You were, you were trained to, to, to purge people. You were trained to bloodlet. You were trained to torture people back to, to health. Eventually, the poor patient said, enough, enough, I feel better. But I think Samuel Hahnemann was a pretty good man. 
and uh, he wanted to do good by his patients. And one of the only substances that worked in those days was uh, quinine for malaria. Of course, they didn't know that it was quinine. It was cinchona bark, which was uh, imported from Peru, but it worked. But the problem was dosage, because obviously this was not standardized stuff. So he became his own guinea pig. And he started to take ground up bark of the cinchona tree until he got sick and he got a fever. And that is exactly what he saw in his malaria patients. And he had been curing malaria with, with this cinchona bark. So he invented this nonsense really that the substance that caused a symptom in a healthy person, which was himself, would cure that symptom in the sick person because he had seen that happen to his patients with cinchona bark. So this is how it was all born. And then he decided that he had to investigate this further. So for example, he would give Peruvian bark as it was called to, uh, to patients. And he said, yes, if you give them a high dose, they get a fever. And this corroborates why it will cure that fever when it is diluted. I mean, bizarre upside down logic. And then uh, he went on to do many other such provings. For example, he would take arsenic uh, and uh, give it to his friends, neighbors, relatives. It was not a good thing to be a relative of Hahnemann in those days. And he would give them increasing doses until they got some sort of symptom. And when you start giving arsenic to someone, they'll get gastric pain, vomiting, and diarrhea. And it's a good idea to stop when that <laughs> sets in. And this gave him an the idea that this would be useful to treat food poisoning because gastric pain, vomiting, and diarrhea are the symptoms that you see with food poisoning. So this was the logic behind homeopathy. And they came up with the whole Materia Medica, like cures like, of course, was the logo in Latin, similar, similibus curantur. And there are numerous kind of homeopathic remedies that have been devised by the method of these provings. The dilutions is what make this so interesting because the way that this is done is that they make the original tincture, they take one drop, dilute it with 99 drops, take one drop, dilute it with 99 drops of water, et cetera. And we can calculate that after 12 such dilutions, there's not a single molecule of original left. Now, of course, we can calculate that because we know something about Avogadro's number which uh, obviously Hahnemann did not know. He had no way of knowing that his dilutions actually contained no possible active ingredient. But today we look at the nonsensical homeopathic remedies that are out there. Berlin wall, for example, I'm not sure exactly how one dilutes Berlin wall, but this is supposed to treat anxiety because of course the Berlin wall created anxiety. Then you have X-ray, diluted 200 C, so not 12 times, but 200 times, which is supposed to be even more potent. And what is this diluted X-ray used for? As you can see, it's um, for relieving aggravated uh, skin rash aggravations at night in bed. So I assume it would not work during the day. It only works when you're in bed at, at, at night. Well, this of course is, is funny, but when they claim that you can use homeopathic remedies to treat COVID, then that puts it into a totally different world. And in India, uh, this has been done quite extensively. Uh, obviously it doesn't work. Uh, homeopathy cannot cure COVID-19, neither can it prevent infections. Uh, what it can do is give you a placebo uh, moment, but let's face it, placebos do not cure viral infections. Neither do they prevent them. And no matter what Aaron Rodgers said this past year, uh, his uh, taking of a homeopathic remedy was not akin to being vaccinated. But even more serious are these clinics that offer cancer therapy with homeopathy. So imagine the, the absurdity of treating uh, an existing disease with non-existent molecules. So you would think that homeopathy would have been buried a long time ago, but here we are 200 years ago and they are still making exactly the same kind of claims that they made back then. 
And this is one of the hallmarks of the alternative stuff. It doesn't progress. And um, obviously with scientific medicine, we're constantly changing. And uh, we often have to say, I don't know, or ifs and buts and maybes. They know everything. They never have to use those kind of words in their vocabulary. Uh, we did have a little bit of success here in Quebec, getting some pharmacies to post these signs, saying that uh, there is absolutely no scientific evidence for homeopathy. But many pharmacists don't want to do this because, of course, it's a moneymaker for them. And uh, when I question them, they say, well, look, you know, if we don't sell it, they'll go to the health food store and buy it there. But I don't know how a pharmacist in good conscience uh, can peddle uh, non-existent molecules. I can understand how Dr. Oz can do that because he is in the business of peddling nonsense. And it's quite tragic because, you know, when he first appeared, he was on with Oprah and he would uh, tell people to eat broccoli and exercise, which was good. And then uh, Oprah made him God, gave him his own show, and then he had to fill five network hours every week. And uh, that's when, you know, came the green coffee bean extract and, and, and the uh, uh, raspberry ketones and all of the quack medicines. And uh, he, he was absolutely blasted when he uh, was subjected to a, a Senate hearing uh, two years ago uh, for basically promoting uh, stuff without any evidence. And... Um, but what really did it for me with Oz, what really buried him, was his promotion of homeopathic starter kit. How, how someone who's a cardiac surgeon can do this, can promote homeopathy, uh, to me is, is, is criminal. And this is the man who's going to run for the Senate from uh, Pennsylvania, and he might win. I mean, we've seen miracles before. Uh, Trump was president, so... Uh, Oz can become a, a senator. Anyway, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater uh, because there is some stuff there that's alternate that may eventually turn out to be useful. And I'm looking forward to hearing about uh, some of this. I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there, anecdotal, uh, and a lot of talk about uh, cancer. Now, the problem here is that these products are not properly regulated. You don't really know what you're getting. Uh, pure CBD, are you really getting a thousand milligram of CBD? And you look at all of these different products out there. And, and as long as these are dietary supplements, which is the way that they are sold, uh, basically they, they defy all regulations. Now, as, as you know, there are certainly reports about cannabinoids, um, THC, CBD, et cetera, for nausea, vomiting, anorexia, various neuropathies. And, but this is not, not new. Uh, synthetic cannabinoids have long been around. Uh, Marinol has you know, been around for, for years. But today, uh, of course, everyone is interested in, in THC and CBD. And the scientific literature has a lot of interesting articles. Uh, there is evidence for pain relief in you know, some cases. And there are a lot of interesting investigations. So uh, I think this is something that is, is worth pursuing because there are studies that, that suggest that there is some promise here. But of course, what we really want to do is uh, make sure that dosages are correct, that you know exactly what you're, you're getting. I mean, you know, what are these 400 cannabinoids, something like that? So, you know, everyone talks about cannabidiol, but there are many others in there that, that perhaps are, are, are active. So just to summarize here, why do people believe in this stuff? Why do they believe in alternative medicine? There's frustration with conventional medicine because doctors, of course, cannot sit for an hour like naturopaths and homeopaths do and take this long medical history with many absurd questions. You guys see patients for what, seven minutes? That seems is the average. So of course there, there's frustration. There's a lack of understanding of the nature of disease, that diseases can come and, come and go. And, and if you happen to take something and the disease goes, you give credit to whatever you took. Lack of understanding of cause and effect. Simple uh, example, uh, the rooster crows, 
the sun comes up, but it doesn't come up because the rooster crowed. But it is so easy to convince people of cause and effect relationships when actually they're just associations, right? Another classic example is uh, breast cancer and wearing of skirts, a very strong association, but obviously skirts do not cause the disease. There's a lack of understanding of the placebo effect that 30 to 40% of the time you will react, whether it's snake oil or one of the modern versions in a gelatin capsule, but they work the same way. And there's a lack of realization that sometimes therapists will just say things that are not true. Uh, here's a, a, a classic one. Uh, <laughs> this book on, on toxic emotions, where she talks about Lou Gehrig's disease. Karen completely cured herself of Lou Gehrig's disease by loving herself unconditionally just 15 minutes a day. We will leave alone what loving yourself unconditionally for 15 minutes a day means, but I think we can be pretty certain that it does not cure Lou Gehrig's disease because no one ever has been cured of Lou Gehrig's disease. And there's a lack of understanding of anecdotal evidence and just because your neighbor got better with their cold if they took a homeopathic remedy doesn't mean it, it worked. But the last sobering thought is that in scientific medicine, there have been lots of errors too. You know that in the late 1800s, early 1900s, women would be diagnosed with anxiety. And you know the kind of therapy that uh, doctors would initiate. And uh, that isn't done anymore. Hopefully this kind of personal massage. And Dr. Walter Freeman champions lobotomy, putting a spike up the nose. This was not in prehistoric times. Joseph Kennedy's daughter, President Kennedy's sister was subjected to this. And then you'll remember that if someone had a heart attack, they used to be put on six weeks bed rest because it just made sense. And for arthritis, they would wear gloves with radioactive materials in it. This was still done in the 1960s. And of course, doctors recommended camel cigarettes. So there are a lot of skeletons in the traditional closet as well. And I leave you with this last example, suppositories, which I suspect many of you have prescribed and used. One would assume that they are designed scientifically in such a way that, that the uh, sharp end would go in first. But no one had ever studied that until now. Here's the study where they actually investigated, which is the best way to insert the suppository. And it turns out, I guess, surprisingly, that it is better to do it this way. But when you think about it, it makes sense. Because when you insert it and the sphincter muscle contracts, it will then push on the narrow end, rocketing the uh, suppository in. So uh, nobody has a monopoly on the truth. And science-based medicine may not always work. But you know what? That's the way to bet. Uh, I don't know if questions are appropriate, but we have a, a website uh, that might probably answer a lot of the questions that you might have. And we also have a newsletter you can sign up for for free. Uh, it comes to you every Saturday. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, I'm always happy to get your emails. So thanks very much for listening to uh, this diatribe. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Schwartz. The Office of Science and Society, I was looking at the, at the entire website and it, it's fantastic. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of gem pieces of information there to be able to help patients make these kinds of decisions because the overwhelming majority of people do not even understand that this is not a regulated field in any way, shape or form. And right. that there's yeah. no standardization of the dosages and, and what they're taking. I do not see any questions in the chat, although there may be uh, more coming. Um, your discussion about the use of uh, marijuana or the um, the um, active ingredients in it is a great segue for our next speaker, who is Dr. Brian uh, McKinnon, and his presentation is going to be on uh, medical marijuana. Brian, you can share your screen. I uh, hopefully I'm sharing it right now. Yes. Do people see? Good. 
So first of all, I have to start is how the hell do I follow up that? Uh, that was a grand talk. Um, on a serious note, I, I do want to, uh, you know, I have, a, a because neurotology is a fairly small field, I do have colleagues right now uh, who I knew through the various associations, the Pulse Society, who unfortunately are in Ukraine. They're my colleagues in Ukraine. And really do let them know that my heart goes out to them and their patients uh, through this very difficult time. Um, but um, what I'm going to talk about is a specific area that uh, Dr. Schwartz touched on, which is medical marijuana. And um, I was introduced to this um, topic uh, as when I was in practice for a brief time in Philadelphia uh, at Hahnemann Hospital. Um, and uh, this became um, a uh, state approved um, area uh, for people to receive medical marijuana. And of course, I was naturally inundated uh, by this. Uh, and because of that, I worked with a, a very gifted medical student, uh, William Valentina. Uh, and we put together two papers. Now, I'm just going to quickly put together my disclosures um, <clears throat> and my disclaimers. Uh, these are my views. Uh, definitely, these are not the views of the University of Texas Medical Branch, uh, nor the uh, Texas, the great state of Texas. It's not the state of Texas, the great state of Texas as well. Um, now, just as a quick background, uh, I did my residency in the Navy. I did my neurotology fellowship at the University of Virginia. I had the good fortune of getting an MBA at Hopkins and a master's of public health with a concentration at the University of Memphis. And I'm currently the, the associ associate professor and chair at interim of the Department of Olaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at University of Texas Medical Branch, which was Byron Bailey's, uh, one of my uh, predecessors here, and are very tough shoes to fill. And I'm going to be looking at a couple of different areas. One, I'm going to explore the current understanding uh, of the role of medical, medical cannabis in geriatric otolaryngology. Um, I'm going to discuss the level of interest otolaryngologists may have in the medical use of cannabis, as well as suggest some directions to gain more insight into its efficacy and potential complications. And for those interested, these are the two papers that we published. Um, the first one was we looked at the medical evidence for this, and then we looked at uh, state certification by otolaryngologists in the, um, I'm going to use the term carefully, in the recommendation of medical marijuana to their patients, because in many states, you make a recommendation, uh, and then you give the recommendation to a dispenser who then provides the form and the potency that they feel is appropriate for the patient's complaint. Um, so there are many preclinical and clinical studies have published potential benefits of cannabis that may have an ailments included, but not limited to nausea, vomiting, secondary chemotherapy, uh, chronic pain, appetite stimulation, glaucoma, uh, the multiple sequela of multiple sclerosis, as well as some antineoplastic activity of cannabinoids on gliomas. Uh, there are also reports linking cannabis to increased risk of addiction, motor vehicle accidents with short-term and long-term use, anxiety and depression, uh, neuropsychological decline when uh, used in childhood, and mounting evidence for the increased risk of later psychotic disorders. So it, the medical evidence is rather mixed on this. I should point out that it is still a Schedule One illegal substance under U.S. federal law. And oh, by the way, it ain't legal in Texas either. I had the unique pleasure of serving on the Galveston County um, grand jury for four and a half months. And anybody who's ever served on a grand jury is that you spend <clears throat> your time being presented cases by DAs to determine if there is sufficient evidence to proceed with the case. And in Texas, you can be arrested for the use and or distribution of marijuana. It is a felony offense. Um, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine in 2017 concluded the following three things or areas where cannabis or cannabinoids may be effective. Uh, treatment of chronic pain in adults, 
uh, treatment of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, and the improvement of patient-reported multiple sclerosis plasticity symptoms. All other conditions have limited evidence or insufficient evidence. And Bryant et al. in 2018 preceded us by publishing a review of the risks and benefits of cannabis use with an emphasis on otolaryngologic disease processes. They specifically discussed the growing evidence of using cannabis to manage pain, inflammation, cancer in the otolaryngologic patient. However, it is important to recognize that cannabis is not a single drug in the pharmacologic sense of the word. There are over 1,000 distinct molecules have been described to be found in the plant species cannabis sativa, including terpenes, phenolic compounds, and nearly 100 distinct cannabinoids. THC and CBD are the most well-known cannabinoids. Um, so when we did our review, the, the goal is a selective analysis for those considering medical cannabis for therapeutic or research purposes. And we did a med, uh, PubMed search using the following terms, which you can see, but I'm not going to repeat. Uh, the literature included provide um, substantive research based on the author's best judgment on cannabis and oligology. So there was a subjective component to this. Um, Individual case reports or case series was less than four patients. Um, four patients or less were excluded from our review. As you can see here, we looked at the number of publications going back over from 1970 to uh, 2019 when we completed our review. And as you can see, the number of publications have grown, but still the number of publications are only about 70 per year currently. When we did a review, you can see where most of the studies were. Uh, not surprisingly, head and neck was a lead area, um, with cancer being one of the lead areas. And interestingly, sleep medicine and neurotology were tied for second. Um, in terms of the head and neck, um, looking at a non-randomized retrospective chart review, uh, comparing patients diagnosed with head and neck cancer treated with radiation therapy or chemotherapy without evidence of recurrence of metastatic disease with patients who underwent the same therapy using medical marijuana uh, that were clinically disease-free suggested medical marijuana may help with the long-term side effects of radiation, subjectively improve weight maintenance, depression, pain, appetite, dysphagia, xerostomia, muscle spasm, and sticky saliva. This is the 2016 study. In addition, a prospective cohort study assessing the quality of life outcomes using the EQ5D and the ESAS questionnaires suggested significant quality of life benefits, including decreased anxiety, pain, depression, and increased appetite and generalized feelings of well being associated with marijuana use among patients with newly diagnosed head and neck cancer. Um, in addition, uh, Lang in 2009 found decreased risk in moderate user who had started later in life of developing head and neck cancer. In terms of neurotology, um, there was a prospective single blind randomized control studies in the mid 70s which showed that cannabis does not have an acute effect on hearing or vestibular function, 1976 and 73 respectively. A prospective non-randomized control study demonstrated chronic marijuana users may have significant vestibular changes. Um, in 2002, a randomized double-blind crossover trial to demonstrate that THC does not have a significant effect on the auditory pathway consistent with the 76 study. 2002, performing a brainstem evoked response audiometry on former drug users uh, finding marijuana and co cocaine may cause diffuse disorders in the brainstem and compromise the transmission of auditory stimuli, regardless of how long these substances are used. And last but not least, uh, Gosh in 2018 determined that cochlear endocannabinoid system may have a protective role in some forms of hearing loss, but an exogenous agonist may be needed to boost the activity of the system for protection against more traumatic insults, such as cisplatinum-induced tinnitus. In specifically regarding tinnitus, there have been several studies in basic science and animal research regarding the presence of cannabinoid receptors 
in the dorsal and ventral cochlear nuclei, suggesting that cannabinoids may not be useful and may even exacerbate tinnitus. So many of these studies use the salicylate-induced or acoustic trauma-induced tinnitus animal model. In 2010, looking at the data of adults from the National Surveys on Drug Use and Health found that a positive association between duration of marijuana use and tinnitus. Uh, for facial plastics and reconstructive surgery, a 2017 study performed a retrospective chart review with prospective data collection in order to determine the effect of med medical cannabis on benign essential blepharospasm and considered it accepted, uh, acceptable to use in spasmodic dysphonia, uh, the sp spastic disorder. I apologize for that mis misspeaking there. And a 2018 study determined through a retrospective review of the medical records, there was no significant differences in the patterns of facial fractures before or after the legalization of cannabis in two hospitals in the state of Colorado. So in that brief review of literature that some of which has a relative uh, focus on patients who would be considered geriatric uh, and be considered geriatric otolaryngology patients, the majority of the studies related to cannabis involve a possible association with the incidence of head and neck cancer. Uh, cannabis may be a useful therapy for otolaryngological patients suffering from blepharospasm, the effects of radiation, and the psychological sequela of receiving a diagnosis of a head and neck cancer. However, geriatric otolaryngology is still in its infancy in determining the efficacy and safety of cannabis among various geriatric otolaryngologic conditions. And of course, further research is required to determine if cannabis has any therapeutic role in the geriatric otolaryngology conditions. Well, what about adoption by otolaryngologists? Well, there is direct indirect evidence that otolaryngologists have not embraced the medicinal use of cannabis with about 0.4% of physicians approved uh, indicating themselves as otolaryngologists. Based on the available information, a conservative estimate is that less than 2% of otolaryngologists are approved to recommend the medicinal use of cannabis. Impediments to embracing medical cannabis likely include the lack of research, the unregulated market patients must use, and the simple fact that cannabis remains illegal under federal law. In terms of what the future holds, as evidence continues to evolve, the medical effects will become better defined. There is the danger of anecdotal, evidence, anecdotal experience being considered evidence of benefit. Alarming is the dissemination of unsupported claims made by some to vulnerable patients who have exhausted conventional options. Since September of 2017, the FDA has issued warning letters for nearly 500 websites. The most recent websites to come under scrutiny market CBD oils for pets and for conditions such as age-related dementia. The mislabeling of cannabis and its extract in both retail stores and state dispensaries is an emerging concern. 2015, a paper analyzed 75 edible products sold in three different West Coast cities and determined 17% were accurately labeled. 23% were underlabeled and 60% were overlabeled with respect to THC content. This variation may reflect the different boiling points of THC and CBD, 157 degrees and 170 degrees Celsius respectively. Undercooking or overcooking edibles may result in decreased or increased levels of compounds. Some states have laboratory regulations to ensure the biochemical contents of products. However, the 2018 study found the interlaboratory differences within the state of Washington varied significantly, underscoring the need for standardized laboratory methodologies across the industry. Finally, those that recommend the strain, dosage, and formulation to patients at dispens dispensaries, known as bud tent, were surveyed and found that only 55% received formal training for their position, only 20% had a medical or scientific training. While many dispensary staff made recommendations consistent with the current evidence, some recommended cannabis that was either not being shown effective for or could even exacerbate a patient's condition. In conclusion, 
the medical use of cannabis on its surface may not seem to apply to the field of geriatric or oncology. The lack of broad regulation adds to the uncertainty of a substance that has become so popular among the public. Much research still needs to be done to overcome the paucity of evidence supporting benefits. No matter what our opinion is regarding cannabis for its recreational and medicinal use, otolaryngologists are vital intermediaries for geriatric patients' access to evidence-based medicine. Um, with that uh, is my talk. And for those who can't see it very well, this was the biostatistics uh, textbook I had for one of my courses during my master's of public health. And one of the wags in my clinic at the time put on a post-it note that said, biostatistics for health sciences and other Irish drinking songs. Uh, and with that, I will yield the rest of my time. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you for that balanced view to see the pros and the cons and how it might apply. I don't see any questions in the chat, so we'll move on to David Eibling. Dr. Eibling, you can take it away. So uh, uh, I'll start off by uh, pointing out that uh, both uh, uh, Dr. Schwartz and Dr. McKinnon are true experts. Uh, what I'm talking about is something that I'm not an expert in. In fact, uh, you're going to recognize that re I really am is I'm a reporter. So I'm going to be reporting uh, what uh, I have learned about talking to patients about alternative therapies. So I have no financial conflicts. Uh, I do need to disclose, though, that I'm a long-standing non-believer. And over the recent past, I've been developed an increasing recognition that uh, alternative uh, therapies may have some value to patients uh, that might be able to be harnessed in the doctor-patient relationship. And I have two other disclosures that might be of some significance. So 50 years ago, as a medical student, I unknowingly chaperoned a church youth group activity that turned out to be a dispensary for illegal marijuana distribution to uh, uh, a, a group of, uh, of teenagers. Uh, having said that, this story would take an hour. I'm not going to complete the story uh, in the time that we have allotted. Uh, let's just say it was my first introduction to the fact that you could actually smell marijuana as it's being smoked. And I now live two blocks from a uh, uh, Pittsburgh uh, uh, medical marijuana dispensary. And when I came by just a couple of hours ago, there was only one empty parking place in the uh, pretty good sized parking lot. So we know this data. We know that many uh, uh, of our patients and others use alternative medicines. I have family members that are uh, deeply committed to their alternative medicines and therapies. And, as, and in addition, uh, something like um, close to three quarters don't tell their physicians, which is going to be one of the themes that I'm going to be talking about here in the next few minutes. So I thought I'd kind of pose this question uh, to, uh, to sort of start the uh, conversation here. And that is, doctor, will weed help my ringing ears? And we just heard from Brian, of course, that it doesn't help your ringing ears. So what can you do? So this is multiple choice. Uh, you can adjust your hearing aids and pretend like you didn't hear the question. I uh, can say, of course, it'll help, but it, it'll still be there, but it won't bother you. And oh, by the way, they could adjust your hearing aids. Uh, and say, have you been watching those Spotify podcasts again? I thought we talked about that last time you were here. Or distract them. Look in the chart. Oh, it looks like you gained a little weight. What did you have to eat for breakfast yesterday morning? And then perhaps most importantly, breathe a sigh of relief when you recognize that your patient has enough confidence in science and in your opinion to actually ask you. So uh, if, uh, if, uh, uh, if we're going to be asking the question of what are our patients taking, we ought to at least have some idea of what we might be able to determine uh, about the science, if you will. So I bought this book because the foreword was by uh, Bernie Siegel, who was a general surgeon who was one of my attendings when I was a PGY2 general surgery resident 
uh, about 45 years ago. And so I thought, that, yeah, if Bernie Siegel wrote the forward, it should be pretty good. And uh, the, by the way, Bernie Siegel was very invested in this idea that the recovery from cancer was somehow related to uh, the uh, patient's uh, mood and their uh, uh, and their their attitude, if you will. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, by Mel Bournes, who's a family physician practicing in Toronto, whose uh, general theme has been to encourage physicians to introduce uh, an appreciation of alternative medicine into their practices. And uh, I'm going to go over some of the quotes from him. Uh, he makes the point that it is a appreciation of the, the fact that this is important to the patient that might actually be uh, harvested or harnessed to improve the doctor-patient relationship. So this I thought was probably the key ingredient. This is from the med page link at the bottom. And then five steps are ask, fair tell, explain science, be respectful and non-judgmental, um, and uh, then collaborate. And every so often you're going to have to perhaps as physicians compromise and negotiate. So all of us have suffered the uh, sequela of not taking a complete history. And I think in laryngology, one of the most common ones that I've encountered is when a patient doesn't respond to the, my therapies that I prescribed for their nasal congestion. And oh, by the way, are you taking any over-the-counter medication? Oh yeah, I'm taking this 12-hour uh, 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 nasal, uh, nasal spray. Oh, and you know, by the way, oxymetazolone now comes in half percent as well as quarter percent. And about a month ago, I had a patient show up with a Turkish version of oxymetazolone. He had no idea what he was taking. And uh, when we figured it out, it was pretty obvious that he had rhinitis medicamentosa. So we've all been in this position. And the point that Borens makes, and we've heard already today, is you got to ask the question. You have to ask the question, are you taking any uh, uh, over-the-counter medications? Are you taking supplements? That's kind of code for alternative medicine. Uh, and are you visiting an alternative practitioner? And uh, this needs to be integrated into our history taking. And I realize the issue, and the issue which we're gonna come up again and again, is how do you find time in a classic, uh, you know, uh, 15 minute O-laryngology visit to do all this. Secondly, is this idea of explaining to patients about science. And we just heard that from uh, Dr. Dr. Schwartz. I mean, the, the, and he pointed out to us that many of our patients don't understand the basic concept of science. And they don't understand that we're looking for evidence. And if we don't have the gold standard double blind randomized trial, we are still accumulating evidence, but it's evidence that's based on this foundation of uncertainty. In other words, before we can uh, uh, accept evidence, we have to accept the fact that we don't know, that we in fact do have levels of uncertainty and patients don't often like to hear the fact that we're uncertain, uh, but this seems to be the best the best uh, evidence. So uh, these are some of Dr. Joe's books. Uh, uh, in case you missed the, uh, uh, the website, it's mcgill.ca slash OSS, or I, I've been using this one, which seems to work well. And I highly recommend you sign up for his weekly newsletters from his center. It's pretty good. So these are some of the books that uh, I'm currently working my way through. I don't know if any of you ever heard about the pistachio principle. That's in the uh, myths, uh, um, uh, monkeys, myths, and molecules. And I'll just tell you, it has something to do with empty shells, uh, but I'm not going to tell you anymore. You can look it up yourself. So uh, I, I, I swapped this from uh, Boren's book, uh, Echinacea, and uh, it's named after hedgehog. And the question is, is it good for uh, upper respiratory tract infections? And it turns out there's been a couple of Cochrane reviews and the Cochrane reviews conclude that there was no evidence that it either was effective as prophylaxis or as treatment. And uh, there's actually also a NIH website 
Um, uh, you can Google alternative medicine website. It's nccih.nih.gov. Uh, that uh, has uh, also uh, a list of references, uh, but the Cochrane Review said, well, possibly there's a prophylaxis effect. Boren happens to believe that it, uh, that it may be effective, and he takes it himself. Here's a page from UpToDate, and uh, UpToDate concluded, uh, after reviewing the, uh, the, the evidence, that it was not effective. It was a minimal benefit, but they basically said it also appears to have a very low risk profile. So that's one of the questions that you're going to be addressing. And that is not just does it work, but okay, if it, if it doesn't work or it probably doesn't work, is it harmful? So what do you say to patients when they ask you, but it's natural, isn't it doc? It's natural stuff. Well, so are, and I'm quoting, I'm quoting Boren's exactly, so are DIG, thyroid, uh, aspirin, and so forth. So patients want to assume it's either natural from an animal or a plant, or it's something that's, um, that is created in a laboratory and then mixed up in big bats. And the assumption then is that that is a dichotomy. It's either or. But what uh, 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 Boren's points out is that in fact, it's a continuum. In other words, there's, a, there's extensive over, overlap uh, and, that, uh, and that natural products are also drugs with pharmacologic effect, such as uh, THC, maybe CBD, and, uh, current, and of course, alcohol, uh, which many of us are familiar with the physiologic effect of alcohol. So as this discussion occurs, as the questions arise from the patient, uh, the, the problem is that for us is to be non-judgmental and to uh, address these questions with respect. And it's difficult sometimes because it just seems like garbage, but yet uh, it, uh, it takes a, a, a moder moderate amount of emotional intelligence to listen uh, and to uh, try to frame the conversation and in the patient's perspective with this idea that hopefully you're going to be able to come to some sort of a, of, of a common ground. And uh, I point out the fact that, uh, that at least what is happening is the patient is that we're acknowledging the fact that the patient is trying to take some responsibility for their own care and to support their own autonomy. And heavens knows we spend a lot of time and effort trying to convince our patients to take more responsibility uh, for their own, their own care. But this takes a well-honed communication skills. And I would suggest that it is only at that point that you can start to have this conversation about, let's collaborate on this. You wanna take some, um, some uh, 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 echinacea, uh, that's, that's fine, uh, but uh, recognize that it's probably, uh, it may not make any benefit, but again, it might. And by, by, developing a collaborative approach to disease uh, with our patients. We are more likely to be able to move them in the direction of uh, better health. But this again, takes time. And this is this whole idea of listening. And you folks are all aware of the data that most physicians don't listen. And, uh, and I would suggest that, uh, that many of us are taxed by busy clinics, busy offices. It's hard to do that. And having the patience with our patients uh, is a critical skill that uh, actually is difficult to develop, but well worth the effort to develop. Well, there are times whenever you can't reach a common ground. And then there may become the opportunity for, comp for compromising and negotiating. And in my mind, the poster child for this, uh, uh, pun intended, 
is this uh, the fact that some pediatricians have will agree to space out uh, newborn uh, uh, infant uh, vaccinations uh, because they have made the conclusion, they come to the conclusion that spacing out vaccinations is better than no vaccinations. Uh, so there may be a need for uh, compromise and negotiation. And although it sometimes is uncomfortable for us, it is still a, uh, an opportunity to build a relationship with the patient. So the next two slides I stole from Borens also, and this is not homeopathic medicine. The term is holistic medicine, but I think those, I think you could pretty well remove the word holistic. This should be called principles of medicine. And I'm not going to read over all of these and discuss them because you can scan them yourselves. But as you can see, much of what this uh, 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 what this is about is how do we build a relationship with patients that leads to healing. And uh, I particularly like number six on this page, and that is that the relationship between the doctor and the patient. Uh, uh, it is oftentimes a very critical, a very critical uh, uh, part of the healing process. Uh, number four is self-explanatory. Prevention is more cost-effective than treatment. Uh, here's another, well, by the way, these are not available on the, uh, uh, on the website uh, uh, that uh, 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 on the uh, national, uh, on the uh, National Holistic uh, Healthcare Association. Uh, this is actually, I, I stole this from, from uh, uh, Boren's book. Uh, and uh, you can read these yourself. There's nothing, nothing here that is rocket science. This is part of good medical care. I particularly like number 12 and that optimal health is more than the absence of illness. illness. It's the ongoing pursuit of the highest qualities of physical, environmental, mental, emotional, uh, and the social domains of the human experience. So I'll finish with a slide listing the five steps uh, that, uh, 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 that Borens has, has uh, proposed and which I encourage, uh, uh, beginning with ask the question, are you taking any alternative medicines, any alternative therapies, any over-the-counter medicines, in addition to the medicines that are on your list. And then don't be afraid to explain what science is all about. I mean, none of us are as articulate as, uh, as uh, Joe Schwartz is in doing so, but that theme still is a critical theme. And as he pointed out to us, it's these themes about what science is are not well recognized. And then this concept of being non-judgmental, uh, which is a real struggle. Uh, and I'll tell you that I struggle with it. Uh, and uh, that then leads to collaboration. And occasionally you're going to have to compromise and negotiate. With no further ado, I'll turn it back over to you, uh, uh, Liana. And uh, certainly questions and discussions would seem appropriate in the last 15 minutes. Yes, those are.